uh, I think is very well equipped to uh, give us a deep background on the uh, Cuban situation. He has had a distinguished career as a uh, professor in the field of political science. He is chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Minnesota and director of the Center of International Relations. Now his particular specialty has been international law and diplomacy. Now he's a native of Colorado and he uh, took his undergraduate degree at the University of Denver and his graduate work at Harvard and Columbia. Now he has an impressive a list of publications to his credit and uh, has uh, frequently appeared in um, uh, as a, a speaker uh, in the Twin City area here uh, on topics relating to foreign policy. It's with a great deal of pleasure that I present Professor Charles H. McLaughlin who will address us on the topic the Monroe Doctrine and Cuba. Professor McLaughlin. Chairman and fellow students, I have no experience with the acoustics here. Do you all hear me easily? I am always, of course, happy to be introduced as well equipped to speak upon the topic upon which I have offered to speak, but I feel I ought to qualify this statement somewhat. I am by no means equipped as a Latin American expert. I do not purport to know the internal situation in Cuba. My interest in the matter stems from the proposal that I ought to speak about the Monroe Doctrine in the context of the Cuban situation, and I felt that possibly I could make some observations about this. I want to begin by saying that I think the whole discussion is occurring in a most unfortunate period. It seems to be necessary for those in the Congress and perhaps to some extent for the press uh, to regard this as a matter connected with the fortunes of the Democratic and the Republican parties in the coming campaign. And I fear that a great many remarks have been made uh, during the debate which has been going on in the past three or four weeks about what we ought to do with respect to Cuba, uh, which are, to say the least, intemperate and perhaps would not have been made in a non-election year, at least not have been made in quite the same form. It was, I presume, uh, hardly necessary for Mr. Truman to say that the reason we're in trouble in Cuba is that Ike didn't have the guts to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. I imagine that the statement uh, is no closer to the truth than it is to courtesy. In any case, there does seem to be a sharp difference of opinion within the Congress, which stems from some remarks made by the President and from the debate over a resolution adopted by the Congress, uh, which has revealed a point of view about this on the one hand, that we ought to adopt forceful methods in dealing with Cuba, and that we would be justified in doing so in the light of the Monroe Doctrine and the contrary opinion that the Monroe Doctrine, uh, whatever it may have been at one time, uh, has been reinterpreted so that it no longer justifies this kind of use of force, or at least justifies it only in certain qualified circumstances. I hope to be able to throw a little light, therefore, at the outset upon what the meaning of the Monroe Doctrine is, what it has been and what it perhaps is now. I am sure that you have all heard of it. I am not equally sure that you have a clear conception of what is meant by it. And it would, I think, be perfectly excusable if you have not, and because it has at different times meant so many different things, and that one can say almost anything and be correct for some period in the history of the United States. It began, of course, with a message to Congress that is, it began in a formal way, with a message to Congress by President Monroe on December 2, 1823. Now, this uh, did not occur without a little preparation. 
There existed at that time in Europe an organization which has been called the Concert of Europe. That is to say, an organization of the principal European states, the purpose of which is in some doubt. That is to say, the purpose varied according to the opinions of the governments involved in the organization. And the British entertained one feeling about it, and the continental powers which had been restored, the governments which had been restored after the Napoleonic Wars entertained a rather different feeling. On the whole, there seems to have been the attitude in the autocratic governments of Russia and Austria and France and Spain now that the concert of Europe ought to be an organization to support legitimacy in the sense in which that is used to refer to governmental arrangements and that consequently interventions by the collective power of the European states in the alliance uh, might be undertaken in support of the position of the ruling houses or to prevent unrest within these states or to prevent revolutionary activities by colonies. This attitude was not shared by the British government, which did not wish to become involved in supporting any kind of movement of this sort on the continent, and which did not look with a kindly eye upon some of the governments there. Under the circumstances, when it became apparent that there would be an effort made to support the Spanish government, and when there was already some intervention in the domestic affairs of Spain on the continent, and some talk about the possibility that the recently liberated colonies in Latin America uh, might again be subjected to Spanish rule with the assistance of European states, the British became quite as concerned as the United States about this. They did not want to be pulled into such an affair, nor did they want to see it occur. And Canning, therefore, was instrumental in interesting the United States in a declaration which he proposed should be a joint declaration by Great Britain and the United States on this subject. It is this, I suppose, which led directly to consideration of the affair by Mr. Adams and Monroe, and they also drew in Thomas Jefferson into the discussion. And the upshot of the consideration of the matter was that while they fully agreed that some declaration ought to be made, that they did not wish to make it in common with the British government. And consequently, we got from President Monroe on December 2nd, 1823, a unilateral statement by the government of the United States with respect to our attitude toward possible interventions by British powers in the Western Hemisphere. Now, I want to read just a few sentences from the message itself and because I think this is necessary to an understanding of what was said. I am jumping right into the middle of it. In the wars of the European powers, in matters relating to themselves, we have never taken any part, nor does it comport with our policy to do so. It is only when our rights are invaded or seriously menaced that we resent injuries or make preparation for our defense. With the movements in this hemisphere, we are of necessity more immediately connected and by causes which must be obvious to all enlightened and impartial observers. The political system, please note those words, the political system of the allied powers is essentially different in this respect from that of America. This difference proceeds from that which exists in their respective governments. We owe it therefore to candor and to the amicable relations existing between the United States and those powers to declare that we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. With the existing colonies or dependencies of any European power, we have not interfered and we shall not interfere. 
but with the governments who have declared their independence and maintained it, and whose independence we have on great consideration and on just principles acknowledged, we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any manner their destiny by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward the United States. Uh, those words were directly quoted. The message then goes on, and I merely paraphrase, to refer to the disorders in Spain and the possibility of some kind of intervention by European powers. Mr. Monroe expressed concern over the danger of an extension of this to the former Spanish colonies in the Western Hemisphere. He said that it was our intent not to interfere with the concerns of Europe and to treat European governments when they were de facto in control as legitimate without further inquiry and to attempt to deal with them on a firm, friendly basis. And then he goes on, and again I quote his words, but in regard to these continents, circumstances are eminently and conspicuously different. It is impossible that the Allied powers should extend their political system to any portion of either continent without endangering our peace and happiness, nor can anyone believe that our southern brethren, if left to themselves, would adopt it of their own accord. It is equally impossible, therefore, that we should behold such interposition in any form with indifference. Well, those are statements drawn from paragraphs 48 and 49 of the annual message to Congress, which of course also dealt with many other matters. Now, what was meant by these remarks? Uh, you, of course, noted the stately diplomatic composition uh, but some of the expressions used, I think, may easily pass by the modern reader. I point particularly to the reference to the European system. Of course, at first glance, this might be taken simply to be a reference to autocratic government as distinct from the kind of government which had been established in the Western Hemisphere. But you perhaps noted that he went on to say that the European system he referred to stemmed from their internal systems. He was, in fact, referring to the European system of the Concert of Europe and to the use which the continental powers, at least, intended to make of it. He was suggesting that we should look with displeasure upon the extension of that European alliance system into the Western Hemisphere or upon a collective intervention by it in trying to restore former possessions of one of those states. And I think it is in this sense that the message must be taken. What did Mr. Monroe mean by the general language that we would regard such conduct by European states as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition to the United States, and by the other statement toward the end of the message, in which left some doubt indeed as to exactly what it is that we might propose to do about this, but indicated that we would regard this as dangerous to the United States, and that it was a kind of conduct which we could not view with indifference. Well, this is simply diplomatic language uh, to state that if anything of the sort should occur in the Western Hemisphere, we propose to meet it with whatever force might be necessary to prevent it. Of course, the matter is not put in so many words, but I am sure that it is a kind of language which diplomats of that day would have understood in that sense, and that the point was certainly not lost. Now, it may be assumed by Americans, I suppose we have a tendency to assume this, that such a firm declaration by our government uh, would immediately be read with great interest and respect by the European governments. But I suspect that this is not quite correct. 
and that they in fact regarded the Monroe Doctrine uh, for a long time with contemptuous indifference and did not look upon the remarks of our government as anything which they need concern themselves about greatly. Uh, certainly the Monroe Doctrine was never admitted by continental states of Europe as being a statement of a principle to which they were obliged to pay any respect. Certainly it was not admitted as a principle which had any foundation in general international law. For the most part, they simply ignored it. And it is only in the light of subsequent history that it took on anything like the significance it now has. This history I cannot go into here in detail, but I want to mention only certain aspects of it which reveal reinterpretations or different interpretations of the intent of the Monroe Doctrine, because I do think that we need to see what it has become in addition to seeing what it was at its origin in order to understand what possible use might be made of it in Cuba. I think it was not a great deterrent to European interferences during perhaps most of the 19th century. It was, however, repeatedly referred to by our statesmen whenever occasion arose, and we thought it could be useful as a deterrent against European conduct in this hemisphere. And gradually, by these references, by our presidents and secretaries of state, it came to have a very large stature in our mind, whatever may have been the impression which it made or these statements made upon European countries. But we need to bear in mind that there was not actually a genuine large-scale effort made by European states to intervene in the Western Hemisphere during the 19th century, and that we perhaps uh, owe to their forbearance more than we owe to the Monroe Doctrine in this respect. At least it can be said that it is difficult to know how much effect the doctrine may have had in creating this forbearance. Perhaps they never would have intervened in a marked way anyway, but this is more than we know. There were some interventions. Now we are all, of course, familiar with those that occurred during the period of the Civil War, and notably the support by the French government in Mexico of the Maximilian regime. And this, of course, occurred at a time when it was very embarrassing to the United States to do anything in a direct way about it, but we did remonstrate very strongly. And when Maximilian's government found itself in serious straits anyway, I presume that our remonstrances were well-timed to make some impression upon the French government. It is indeed doubtful whether they could have sustained Maximilian anyway and probably they were prepared to pull out and regard the matter as a bad job. But be that as it may, uh, our firm declarations with respect to it seem to coincide with their determination to withdraw, and therefore it seemed in some sense to be a victory for the doctrine. Similarly, there have been other minor interventions from time to time in lesser Latin American states, lesser in size, uh, which have provoked us into comments based upon the Monroe Doctrine. Now, this was true of an intervention in San Domingo, for example, and later on it seems to have had something to do with our comments about several of the Caribbean states and about the Panama Canal issue. As to the canal, however, it must be said uh, that we here violated one of our fixed policies uh, because we seem, generally speaking, to have felt that this was not only a unilateral declaration which we were making, but that it was a position which we proposed to enforce by unilateral efforts. And this uh, unilateral aspect went not only to an avoidance of collective action in common with any European power, but also with any Latin American power. However, in the canal matter, 
we did in 1850, enter into a treaty with the British government. Now, this, of course, does not directly invoke the Monroe Doctrine, uh, but it certainly does refer to a matter which we have all along regarded as of essential strategic interest to the United States. And we, in effect, agreed with the British that we would collaborate with them in respect to any Isthmian Canal project. We were later embarrassed by these arrangements, of course, and we sought to get out of them by unilateral declarations, and the British reminded us politely that we didn't have a legal leg to stand on, which was correct. And eventually we managed to persuade them to accept a revision of this position in the hay Ponsfoot Convention, uh, which allowed the United States to go ahead unilaterally with the construction of the Panama Canal. But here, at least, uh, is one instance in which we deviated from the practice which we seem to be setting up as the procedure we intended to follow in Latin American affairs. And certainly, if not directly stated, there is an obvious connection between canal politics and the Monroe Doctrine. And during the administration of Mr. Cleveland, uh, we were confronted with the Venezuelan dispute. Now, this is a matter between Venezuela and Great Britain over territory, the British, of course, holding the neighboring area of British Guiana. And for many years, uh, there had been a dispute between the two governments about this territory. The British had declined uh, to deal with this by arbitration. The United States, during the Cleveland administration, when this again came to a head, uh, took a very forceful and blunt position. Uh, we urged upon the British that they must arbitrate the matter, and the President, when they declined, uh, went the length of suggesting that the United States ought to set up some kind of commission which should look into the facts of the dispute and make a report upon them, a disinterested commission, of course, he said, and that in the light of that report, the United States should insist that the British government must either accept the report or settle the matter by arbitration. Now, well, the British, of course, uh, regarded all this, no doubt, as uh, very presumptuous on our part and as affecting a matter which was a concern to Great Britain and Venezuela over an established British colony and therefore not of concern to us and not even within the Monroe Doctrine, uh, since the original statement by Mr. Monroe had admitted that we were not taking account of existing European colonies in the Western Hemisphere. But be that as it may, uh, we pushed forward with this, and again it must be said that whether or not it was the doctrine which succeeded, the British did acquiesce. Now, they did agree to the arbitration, and consequently it did appear to be a victory for the position asserted by the United States, and not only that, but it appeared to be, to some extent, an extension of the doctrine into areas which had not been specifically included at the outset, so that again it gained somewhat in stature. Then in the period of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and we find still another difficulty arising, which led to what has been called the Roosevelt Corollary of the Monroe Doctrine. This came about because President Roosevelt felt that several of the Caribbean republics were in serious financial difficulties. They owed large amounts of money to European creditors, their governments had made no satisfactory arrangements for financial responsibility. The European governments, on behalf of their nationals, were interested in assisting them in collecting the debts due to them. And there was a distinct danger in the mind of our government that this kind of situation in the Caribbean area might lead to direct interventions and lead to them under circumstances which would give the European states some ground for saying that they had proper cause of complaint. 
and therefore Mr. Roosevelt suggested that perhaps the United States ought to take what was again a novel position with respect to this. I read just a sentence or two from one of his messages of February 15, 1905. An aggrieved nation can, without interfering with the Monroe Doctrine, take what action it sees fit in the adjustment of its disputes with American states, provided that action does not take the shape of interference with their form of government or the despoilment of their territory under any disguise. But short of this, when the question is one of a money claim, the only way which remains finally to collect it is a blockade or bombardment or the seizure of the custom houses, and in this and this means, as has been said above, what is in effect a possession, even though only a temporary possession of territory. The United States then becomes a party in interest because under the Monroe Doctrine, it cannot see any European power seize and permanently occupy the territory of one of these republics, and yet such seizure of territory, disguised or undisguised, may eventually offer the only way in which the power in question can collect any debts, unless there is interference on the part of the United States well, this rather questionable extension of the doctrine, of course, led Mr. Roosevelt to feel that the United States ought to send Marines, United States Marines, to certain Caribbean republics to assist them in paying their debts. And instead of having European states occupying their custom houses and collecting their tariffs and paying out part of them to creditors, the United States did this. As you can imagine, uh, neither European nor North American intervention for such purposes uh, could seem particularly pleasant to the Caribbean republics. And we naturally developed a far lower position in their esteem than we had occupied earlier with our expressions about the Monroe Doctrine. They now began to wonder whether the Monroe Doctrine was not simply a device whereby the United States intended to exercise a deliberate close hegemony over Latin American republics and really run the Western Hemisphere. And of course the intervention of foreign troops could not but be extremely distasteful to them. So that we lost ground in inter-American relations Although, oddly, I suppose we slightly gained ground for the Monroe Doctrine in European opinion because it now seemed to European states that perhaps there was something in this doctrine of value to them if the United States would assist in collecting the debts for them. Now this corollary, as it has been called, has subsequently been repudiated. It was a uh, questioned very explicitly in a memorandum drafted by the Under Secretary of State, Mr. J. Reuben Clark, in 1928, and his position was then taken up by the Department of State in official communications to Latin American republics in 1930, and so that we can say that the Roosevelt Corollary has officially been repudiated as an element of United States policy, and that this was, of course, a part of the general reorientation which took place in the good neighbor policy of the second Roosevelt. It was his view that uh, it was a matter of first importance to solidify the relations of the American republics uh, doubtless of more importance than to pursue certain aspects, at least, of the Monroe Doctrine or accretions upon the Monroe Doctrine, such as the Roosevelt Corollary. And at the same time that he, we were getting rid of that, we, of course, were also reorienting our relations with Cuba. Uh, because Cuba, when it had gained its independence, had gained it under some kind of sponsorship of the United States, which, after all, had fought the Spanish-American War. And we felt some responsibility, not without reason, for assuring uh, that the independence of Cuba had not only been gained, but would be preserved. 
and therefore we insisted upon the acceptance by the Cuban government of what has come to be called the Platt Amendment, which became a constitutional principle for Cuba for some years, and which simply stated that uh, we would feel a right to intervene in Cuban affairs if Cuban independence should ever be alienated in favor of some other state than the United States, as they could not cede away their sovereignty or their territory to another power without uh, opening for us a treaty right to intervene to prevent this. Now the Cubans, I suppose, may have appreciated this at the outset. I think that no people really appreciates this kind of sponsorship, even though it is beneficial. Now, but they gradually came to resent it and to feel that it was a limitation upon their sovereignty, whatever that means. And so that by the 30s, it had also become a political issue of some proportions. The United States' presence in Guantanamo Bay had, of course, also been a part of original arrangements after the Spanish-American War. We there had a naval and coaling base. And this, I suppose, uh, was looked upon uh, with some mixed feelings by the Cubans because, of course, they realized uh, that it was part of the hemispheric defense system but they also realized that it was actually a uh, United States defense and not a collective hemispheric defense which was operating here. And the same attitude, of course, could be taken with respect to our position in the Panama Canal, that while Latin American states generally regarded it as beneficial to be assured of the preservation of this open waterway, it was still being assured by unilateral action of the United States and not by collective action of the American republics. So that while these things meant very little to American opinion, and I suppose we tended to regard ourselves as standing in the position of general benefactors, assuring the tranquility, peace, and security of the Latin American republics, uh, they uh, don't look at it quite that way. They want to be secure, but they also want to feel that they are a part of the security system. And the second Roosevelt, of course, took this up, Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, and in the reorientation of our policy, which has been called the good neighbor policy, we, of course, renounced the Platt Amendment and did a good deal in this way to soothe relationships with Latin American states. Now all of this is in the background and there are still a few other things perhaps uh, which might be mentioned. We have had <coughs> any number of declarations on some of these subjects by our statesmen. Mr. Hughes on one occasion, the Secretary of State, remarked that encroachments on the political independence of American states must be regarded by us as a security threat. And he referred to the French intervention in Mexico during the Civil War and went on to say that uh, the United States remained opposed to any non-American action encroaching upon the political independence of American states under any guise statement made as late as 1923. He also uh, announced his position with respect to the Monroe Doctrine as it applied to the Panama Canal in another speech in which he indicated that he felt that the spirit of the Monroe Doctrine necessitated our regarding any possible danger to the Panama Canal as within the meaning of the doctrine because the canal itself he considered to be essential to the security of the United States and therefore to be the kind of threat which was implicit in the basic meaning of the doctrine. And so that when you consider uh, all these declarations and then ask yourself uh, what is the present position of the doctrine, you must admit that on to a quite recent period and we have continued to talk in a spirit which uh, the Latin Americans are just a little restive about. They appreciate it to some extent, but they wish it weren't a unilateral matter. 
In 1912, there was a Senate resolution with respect to a possible Japanese intervention in the Magdalena Bay area. And not by direct government intervention, but by a Japanese company. And the Senate resolution uh, seems to be something that might almost have been adopted last week. They said when any harbor or other place in the American continents is so situated that the occupation thereof for military or naval purposes might threaten the communications or the safety of the United States, the government of the United States could not see without grave concern the possession of such harbor or other place by any corporation or other association which has such a relation to another government, not American, as to give that government practical power of control for naval or military purposes. Finally, we have to take into account, of course, in this estimate of what the doctrine means, the whole development which has occurred in bringing into being the organization of American states. Now, this, of course, began uh, during and after World War II, in some respects even a little before, and it has resulted in the mind of many persons in making a unilateral doctrine over into a multilateral doctrine. But let us ask quite closely how far this is correct. Certainly it is true that the United States, by a multilateral treaty with the other American republics, agreed to a system of consultation in the event of threats to security in the Western Hemisphere. This means, of course, that foreign ministers will engage in meetings whenever necessary to consider what ought to be done about such threats. Further, in the organization of the OAS, we have entered into an arrangement which at least makes possible the organization of collective security mechanisms, if agreed upon, in meeting such threats. Now this means, therefore, that there is at least a chance that if a European state or other state were to intervene in the Western Hemisphere, the result would be a collective action by all American republics and that we would have a responsibility, a direct legal obligation to consult with them as to this. Does this mean that the United States has relinquished the unilateral aspect of the Monroe Doctrine? It is here, of course, that there has been a rather sharp difference of opinion which continues to the present day. I would say that our government has taken the position that the doctrine is still a unilateral doctrine for some purposes and that this is true when our safety is threatened by the conduct of an outside power. That under no circumstances do we relinquish what we would regard as the right of self-defense and that we would regard the right of self-defense perhaps as extending to situations in which an outside power interfered with a Caribbean state or South American state. But of course it then becomes a factual question whether the kind of interference which has occurred is one which directly threatens the United States. Perhaps I should leave out the directly since I have no uh, really competent authority for inserting it. And this again is one of the question marks how direct the threat must be. So when we come to the Cuban situation, we are left with a real problem how much of the doctrine is still operative in a legal sense. And this was at the heart of the recent congressional discussion. There was adopted, you will remember, by the Congress, a statement which then led to a press discussion. And there was also a statement made by President Kennedy and this was then reinterpreted by Senator Humphrey. And all of this uh, conversation uh, was published in the last two weeks in the Minneapolis Star, uh, plus some other observations by Mr. Kroc as to what had happened to the Monroe Doctrine at the hands of President Kennedy.
Now, Mr. Crock uh, tried to summarize it somewhat in this way. Now, he felt that the congressional resolution, to some extent, followed the doctrine formalistically. It referred to the extension of international communism into Cuba. It said, uh, has increasingly extended into Cuba its political, economic, and military sphere of enforcement. But then, Mr. Croc said, uh, it deviated from the doctrine because it did not reach the obvious conclusion that our peace and happiness, in the words of the original doctrine, were endangered by this. Instead, it merely declared the United States is determined to prevent, by whatever means may be necessary, including the use of arms, the Marxist-Leninist regime in Cuba from extending by force or the threat of force its aggressive or subversive activities to any part of this hemisphere. And went on to say we would prevent this in Cuba, prevent in Cuba the creation or use of an externally supported military capability endangering the security of the United States. So, said Croc, uh, this seems to mean uh, that we have now whittled down the Monroe Doctrine to a statement that the United States must be in immediate danger uh, before the doctrine would operate. And he views this as a shift from the original doctrine. Well, I hope I have made it clear that it is indeed a shift from the original doctrine, but one which was already implicit to a considerable degree in the arrangements under the Organization of American States, that it has to be apparently a threat to the safety of the United States as such, and not simply to hemispheric safety, and to get away from the multilateral operation of the doctrine, if we can put it that way, or the multilateral collective security system, which we have agreed to. So that there is indeed a sense in which the doctrine has in the past been whittled down, and I am surprised to see that there is so much uh, reluctance to admit this. Now, Mr. Humphrey felt it uh, incumbent upon him to retort in the press uh, because uh, his name had been linked with the president's as being the only member of the Senate who was willing to admit that there was such a whittling down. And apparently Mr. Humphrey felt that this didn't correctly state his views. Uh, his comment was that he understood the new statement of the doctrine, which he called the, Hen the Kennedy Doctrine, as involving a number of specific points. Uh, first, uh, that no communist threats or weapons would keep us from military action against communism in Cuba if we should find it necessary. Well, that, of course, is not helpful because it says nothing about the circumstances under which we might find it necessary. Secondly, if the communist buildup in Cuba endangers our security, for example, by hitting at the position in Guantanamo Bay or Panama or the Cape Canaveral testing sites or the security of Americans in Cuba, now these are pretty specific, or if there should be aggression from Cuba against any American country, or if an offensive base should be developed in Cuba, then we would act. Now here, I think, Mr. Humphrey is uh, coming down to cases, of course. I'm not sure whether he is expressing the exact views of the president in the matter, but I presume he is close to Mr. Kennedy on such a question. And this, of course, uh, does express, therefore, some kinds of events which we would apparently regard as dangerous to the safety of the United States, which might result in unilateral military force by the United States. Now, of course, our position in Guantanamo, that's readily understandable. Our position in Panama goes right back to Mr. Hughes' arguments about the essential character of the canal to the defense of the United States, as well as to the hemisphere. The protection of Americans in Cuba, of course, is an American interest. The Cape Canaveral activities. Uh, so that it is not quite clear uh, that there's any great extension there, but the other point which he makes about an offensive base in Cuba is perhaps the one which interests us most. 
It is just here, I take it, that the Kennedy administration is not convinced that the danger at present exists. And it is quite uh, at this point uh, that I am convinced that I don't know the answer and don't pretend to say what it is. Now, we have been given by various commentators statements about what kind of materials are going into Cuba. It would appear that there are about 5,000 Russian technicians. It would appear that a number of bases are being erected in Cuba for the use of missiles, uh, but that the missiles intended to be used are ground-to-air missiles of about 20 to 30 miles range, or ground-to-ship missiles of about equal range. Apparently, the Kennedy administration is of the opinion that these cannot be regarded, in the present stage of base development at least, as a direct offensive threat to the United States, and that they are really intended for defensive purposes. I must add in this connection uh, that uh, it behooves us to have some understanding of the Cuban feeling, at least after the Bay of Pigs episode, uh, that the United States might conceivably be an aggressor in Cuba. I think we can hardly deny them the validity of this suspicion. Under these circumstances, uh, it is not unlikely that the Cuban government, with the assistance of the Russians, uh, would erect defensive bases, and really mean them to be defensive bases, to be used against another kind of effort to invade Cuba, whether from the United States or from one of the Caribbean republics. There are many Caribbean statesmen which are, who have been uh, talking about a possible invasion, a collective force which might be formed to invade Cuba and straighten the situation out. Uh, so that I think uh, we ought not to be rushed into the conclusion that because some missile bases are being erected, they necessarily are thought of by the Cubans as possible offensive bases. Neither, of course, can we very well afford to ignore what is going on, because after all, it is a rather uh, thin separation which exists between offensive and defensive weapons, and the possibility of converting a base to the use of other kinds of weapons in fairly short order certainly exists. I remember that interesting discussion which occurred back during World War I, at the time we were dealing with the problem of arming merchant vessels, uh, as to whether a certain kind of armament which might be put aboard a merchant vessel was offensive or defensive in nature, and therefore whether certain rules of law should be invoked with respect to it, which would permit or would not permit submarine attack upon it. And somebody argued that if the gun were mounted in such a way that uh, it could only swing through a given arc, uh, not point in every direction, it can only point aft, that it would necessarily be a defensive weapon, apparently quite ignoring the point that you could turn the ship around. And so that uh, this sort of business uh, needs to be approached with some caution. I wouldn't for a moment want to argue that our government shouldn't watch this with the utmost care and exercise a very close surveillance by any means which are open to it uh, to continuously determine what the facts are in Cuba and what is happening there. The other points which Mr. Humphrey made uh, seem less relevant to this discussion, and I shan't take time to go through them. There are just a few other things that I want to say about this. I think you have gathered from what I have said already that I uh, incline toward the position at the moment of the Kennedy administration that while we could use the Monroe Doctrine in the case of a direct threat to the safety of the United States, even without consultation with the other American republics, that it is not yet clear that this threat exists, and that therefore we ought still to be going through the motions of trying to organize collective action of American republics with respect to the Cuban situation. Now, of course, this is not easy to do for a variety of political reasons. But at least it seems to be the thing which we in good faith undertook 
by a formal treaty to do, and which we therefore can hardly escape from with a good grace. He has not excluded, the President has not excluded the possibility that the situation might develop in a direction in Cuba which would open the need for a unilateral military action by the United States. And I think it has not been quite fair of those who are attacking him on this ground to suggest that he is merely being weak about it. I think he is really trying to observe the international obligations of the United States in acting the way he is acting and is uh, keeping open the possibility that he may have to act directly. But let me finally put this matter into a little broader context. We are also engaged at the moment in what we have called the Alliance for Progress in this hemisphere. Now we have come to the conclusion that the economic predicament of the Latin American states opens them to communist penetration, infiltration, and that unless something can be done about this rather rapidly, now we will have the kind of dangerous situation which cannot be pinned down in simple military terms as a threat to security, but which nevertheless in any broad sense is clearly a great threat. We are not making much progress with the Alliance, I regret to say. Now the reasons are quite obvious. They are implicit in the situation in Latin America and they are implicit in the past relations between Latin America and ourselves, which make it difficult for us to proceed without becoming offensive in certain ways. We must recognize that we have one of the most critical kinds of problems here and that we have to approach it with a view to the extreme sensitivity of the Latin American republics. Now this context again I think suggests uh, that Mr. Kennedy is right to exercise restraint just as long as he can exercise it. I have in mind the fact that many of these governments are held by regimes uh, which are anything but liberal. Uh, that the general population of these republics in many cases uh, consists of persons who are, shall we say, extremely underprivileged you have Indian populations, Negro populations uh, in the hinterland areas away from the coasts who exist in uh, hovels and villages, in bad agricultural areas who scarcely eke out a living. And you have uh, all of the wealth of Latin America and the industry and the culture concentrated in the great coastal cities and not much in between. Uh, you have in the rural areas uh, a system uh, sometimes referred to as the hacienda system in a number of these republics, uh, which, uh, since we have not the time to go into it more precisely, can simply be put down as a kind of species of feudal organization of land holding, in which there is no possibility for the peon uh, to rise from his existing station, and in which uh, the landholder tends to become a kind of a uh, petty local politico, a leader in the regional area in which he lives. Now you have therefore a sharp split between city politics and rural politics and often find uh, the rural political leaders moving in and controlling the urban politics and therefore having not even a proper appreciation for necessary reform there. These great discrepancies of economic status uh, coupled with a political system which does not intend to do much about them in many of these republics, if it can help it, uh, presents an almost insoluble front toward uh, technical assistance projects of a really effective kind. And somehow the United States is now confronted with the problem of getting behind this political screen and doing some real good knowing perfectly well that the kind of good that has to be done can only serve to undermine the political regimes. That is what is needed there is an extensive system of land tenure reform 
and of course basic agricultural reform as to methods, a uh, overhauling and expansion of the educational system, especially uh, not in the professions in which they are well provided, but in the more rudimentary skills, and that this kind of thing is not going to be readily and easily accepted by the existing political regimes. Now, if you agree with me that it's important that this thing shall be done and that it can only be done by the most delicate kind of negotiations, I think you will see the context I have in mind when I speak about Cuba and the Monroe Doctrine, that we could throw ourselves 50 years behind time and destroy most of our prospects of improvement in Latin America almost at one fell swoop if uh, we suddenly darted into Cuba with major political forces without having gotten the assent and clearance of the American republics to this kind of action. So that this is an additional reason uh, why Mr. Kennedy's administration has to exercise the kind of extreme caution which it has to date exercised, and why it does talk in these qualified ways about the Monroe Doctrine, why it does not rush forward uh, with simple force to solve our problems in the good old 19th century manner. Well, thank you, Dr. McLaughlin, for that uh, splendid presentation. And let me remind you again that there will be an opportunity to meet uh, Dr. McLaughlin, address questions to him in the lounge uh, just across the hall. And uh, we'll uh, uh, declare then the uh, convocation adjourned. And those of you who uh, would like to uh, be in the lounge can move over there now. <laughs> <laughs>